Okay, so I think I'm going to start out being brutally honest. This was the most difficult talk that I have ever written. And as I was sitting in my office on the normally stress-free shores of Gall Lake at Kellogg Biological Station, I was, I was kind of freaking out. And the best analogy that I can come up with is that I felt like I was a fourth or fifth year graduate student again. And for those of you who have blocked that from your memory, or maybe some of you who aren't quite at that stage yet, that's what I like to call the year of despair. And that's the year when you have your experiments and they're running and you're collecting all this data and you're sitting there trying to interpret your data. And it's not always easy to interpret. And so you spend a lot of time banging your head against the wall, thinking, why did I ever go down this path to begin with? And that's what I was doing. And I think the reason I was doing it was because for the first time in a while, I went back to some of the very first experiments I did for my PhD work. And I realized that even though I had been thinking about the system, for over 10 years, there were still some results that I didn't have a good explanation for. So at this point, I want to thank the organizers. One, for testing out my physiological stress response. It's working great, sweat, not sleeping, you know, rapid heart rate. It's, I'm, I'm in tip-top shape. Um, but also for really motivating for me to think through this data again. And I think with a little bit of a fresh perspective. So I do have some ideas now. So I also want to thank, thank them for bringing together this really great audience because I think you're the perfect group to test out some of these ideas and see if you buy my new explanations. Um, so initially I was planning to talk about how evolution in native species, so most of the talks here are focusing on evolution of invaders. I'm really focusing on how invasive species cause evolutionary changes in natives, how those affect other species interactions. Um, so that's kind of the implications for community ecology part of the title. But now, I'm really focusing, I, I shift my focus slightly, and I'm really thinking about how community ecology affects the likelihood of those evolutionary responses. So biological invasions inevitably result in novel species interactions. And these novel species interactions can cause evolutionary change. And that's because all individuals in a population might not be equally affected by the invader, right? And some, some individuals might possess traits that make them better able to survive and reproduce in these new invaded environments. And here's an example from Beth Ledger's work. Let's see if I can figure this out. Um, she has looked at how, in, I don't know what just fell. Okay, we'll move on. Um, she has looked at how invasive species affect the evolution of native competitors. Here's one example from her work looking at how squirrel tail, a native grass species, um, has evolved increased competitive ability against cheatgrass, that's the invasive plant you see all through here. Um, and she pre pretty convincingly shows that these native plants from invaded areas have um, increased competitive ability, so they're less affected by competition with the cheatgrass than populations um, that have been invaded by, or that, sorry, that populations that have not been invaded by the cheatgrass. So cheatgrass comes in, it causes the evolution in the native species to be more tolerant of cheatgrass competition. And I think there are now several studies showing how natives can evolve in response to biological invasions. And in many of the cases, it's scenarios like this, where we're looking at a really, really dominant invader. So cheatgrass, it forms these virtual monocultures. It has huge effects on the below ground soil communities. It alters fire frequency. And it's, it's, it really is a virtual monoculture. So um, evolutionary responses to really big invaders um, that are likely to have really big impacts. And what I've started to wonder is would we see um, similar evolutionary responses in more complex communities, where these native species are not just dealing with the selective effects of the cheatgrass, but also with their herbivores, their pathogens, other plant competitors in the community. And so this is the theme that I'll focus on today. How does the surrounding community affect the likelihood of evolutionary change in these native species? And so to address this theme, I'm going to go back to my dissertation work, and I'm going to take you through three parts. The first is, is basic ecology, how an invasive plant species, Metacago polymorpha shown there, comes in and causes novel species interactions for a native plant. Um, then I'll move on and talk about how this invasive species might alter patterns of natural selection on the native. And then finally, how the community context might influence the likelihood of evolutionary change actually observing evolutionary responses in the native. So here's this, the study system. I was really focused on this native plant here, Acmesmon rangelianus, formerly Lotus rangelianus. That's what I, I, I'll call it, I'll call it Lotus. That's what it was when I was studying it. I won't be able to remember the new name. 
Um, it's this cute little plant in the pea family. Um, and in uninvaded areas, so areas that have not been invaded by the exotic plant that I will introduce you to in a minute, um, it's fed upon by uh, a few different types of herbivores. So the big ones are this guy. This is a Apion weaver, weevil bud galler, so it actually oviposits and develops in the developing buds, a hymenopteran seed predator, um, a few species of aphids, and then a few other lepidopteran herbivores that are typically pretty rare. Then this invasive plant, Metacago polymorpha, came in um, to these study systems. It was introduced to California in the late 1800s. Um, it became really abundant in a lot of the non-serpentine grasslands in the California coast range. And in the areas where I worked at the time when I worked there, these two species were really some of the most dominant um, plant species in these grasslands. Along with the invasion of Metacago, about 70, 80 years later, the Egyptian alfalfa weevil also invaded. It, it's called Hypera brunipennis, I'll call it Hypera. And this weevil, it's a, a Fabici specialist, so it really likes to eat Metacago. However, it also really likes to eat the native lotus. And what I found when I was just doing a series of observations out at the McLaughlin Reserve, um, I found that lotus individuals in invaded sites, those are the red bars here, tended to receive a lot more herbivory from Hypera than lotus individuals in uninvaded sites. And it looked to be a case of, of essentially apparent competition. Metacago comes in, it boosts densities of Hypera to really high levels, and as a result, the native lotus gets much more damage in invaded areas compared to uninvaded areas. And I think this is a case where a picture is worth a thousand words. This is what lotus looks like in the uninvaded areas. Um, it's a nice, healthy plant, very little herbivory, will produce lots of flowers, tons of seeds. And here's what lotus looks like in areas invaded by Metacago. This is the plant here. It's pretty much a stick with a few ratty leaves on it. Um, this plant probably won't survive to flower. It won't set many seeds. Um, and, and these definitely aren't extreme photos. Um, when I was doing my dissertation work, you could pull a, a lotus plant and I could tell you whether it came from an uninvaded or an invaded location. There are really strong differences in herbivory. <coughs> So to experimentally test um, the fitness effects of this invasion on the native lotus, I set up an ex a series of experimental manipulations where I removed Metacago from half of my plots and I sprayed half of my plots with the generalist insecticide. So two by two factorial experiment manipulating Metacago presence and also the presence of insect herbivores. And what I found with these experiments is first of all that my insecticide treatments worked. Insectic damage levels did tend to be lower in insecticided plots compared to non-insecticided plots. And I also found that Metacago did increase herbivory on the native lotus, even at these relatively small spatial scales. So these were three meter by three meter plots. The densities of Metacago in these plots were tremendous. In some plots, I removed about 24,000 Metacago seedlings um, from the Metacago removal plots. So these were really heavily invaded sites that I was working in. I also found that Metacago and these insect herbivores decreased lotus fitness, but the mechanism of that effect varied across years. So insects reduced um, lotus seed production, not surprisingly, um, and Metacago, always shown here in the red, also reduced lotus seed production. In 2002, it only reduced lotus seed production when insects had been experimentally reduced with insecticide. So what this suggests to me is that there's a direct competitive effect of Metacago on the native lotus, and that's what's causing the reduced seed production. In 2003, we saw a different effect. Once again, insects reduced lotus seed production. Metacago also reduced lotus seed production, but in this case, only in the presence of insect herbivores, suggesting indirect effects only, presumably because Metacago increases damage to lotus. That's what's causing this decreased fitness. So what can explain these two different effects? Why do we see direct effects one year, indirect effects another year? Well, uh, I think it's variation in a few other herbivores in the community. In 2002, these bud gallers and these seed predators also tended to be relatively abundant, and they responded significantly to the Metacago treatment, Metacago removal treatments, but in the opposite direction of Hypera. So while Metacago, sorry, while Hypera, while Metacago, tended to increase hypera damage to lotus, 
It significantly decreased bud galling rates, significantly decreased seed predation rates. So here we have these opposing effects of Metacago on different members of the herbivore community. In contrast, in 2003, only Hypera responded significantly to Metacago. So once again, Metacago increased Hypera damage to Lotus, but bud gallers and seed predators were both less abundant and also didn't respond to these Metacago removal treatments. So I think what's happening is that the net indirect effect of Metacago on Lotus Fitness really depends on herbivore community composition. In 2002, Metacago tended to increase hyper herbivory, but significantly reduced herbivory from these two late season herbivores. And this reduction in herbivory from these late season herbivores counteracted the fitness effects of increased hyper herbivory and also the direct competitive effects of Metacago. So we don't see any fitness effects of Metacago on Lotus in that year when insects are present anyway. Um, in 2003, these late season herbivores did not respond to the presence of Metacago, Hypera did. So we see this negative net indirect effect on lotus fitness. So just to summarize these ecological effects, there are strong fitness effects of Metacago invasion on the native lotus, but these, the magnitude of these effects and, and the mechanism through which they occur really depends on the herbivore community. So now that I've shown that there's these strong fitness effects, my next step was to see if Metacago altered patterns of natural selection on lotus traits, um, and in particular on lotus defensive traits. And so I went about this by conducting a phenotypic selection analysis, by, looking, by measuring selection in my experimental treatment plots that I described earlier, so the Metacago presence absence plots, the herbivore presence absence plots, I also constructed additional plots in naturally uninvaded habitats and looked at selection in, in those environments as well. So I planted individuals from 73 families into these plots, their full sieve families, and I measured several traits on each family, uh, resistance to hypera, tolerance to hypera damage, and then fitness as both survival to flowering and seed number. And then what I did was I estimated selection on lotus traits in each individual plot. And I wanted to do this because I was really interested in what, what are causing these, different patterns of, these different patterns of natural selection. I wanted to be able to attribute changes in natural selection to my experimental treatments, so I needed replicated um, measures of selection. And so here's a schematic of what I did. This is real data from one of my plots. We have survival on the y-axis, uh, standardized values for a defense trait on the x-axis. In this particular plot, most individuals died. A few survived, and those that survived tended to have higher levels of these anti-herbivore defenses. So I did a logistic regression, and what I'll show you from now on are kind of cartoons of this real data. I can come up with a regression coefficient for each individual plot, so I have 11 to 12 plots within each treatment, 11 to 12 estimates of selection. Um, and then what I will show you in the following graphs is the mean of all of those independent estimates of selection. So what we might expect is we might expect to see strong selection for increased levels of, of lotus defense in the presence of Metacago, where insect herbivory is most intense, weaker selection in areas where I've experimentally removed Metacago, and even weaker selection in naturally uninvaded environments that typically receive very low levels of insect herbivory, hypera herbivory. And that's exactly what I found in 2003, the year that I did this study. Strong selection for increased tolerance to hyper herbivory in the presence of Metacago, weaker selection when we experimentally remove it, and then selection against increased tolerance um, in completely uninvaded areas. So here's the mechanism, right? In uninvaded populations, there's no Metacago. Herbivore densities stay really low. Lotus gets little damage. And as a result, we don't see any selection on lotus defenses against hypera. In invaded populations, Metacago invades, herbivore densities increase, lotus receives a ton of herbivory, and we see strong selection for increased lotus defenses. Um, I forgot to mention in the previous figure, that, that pattern is only observed in the presence of insect herbivores. In my insecticided plots, Metacago did not affect selection on lotus tolerance to herbivory. <clears throat> So here we have strong fitness effects of this invader. We have evidence that this invader affects patterns of natural selection on the native species. Um, the, next, the next project in my dissertation was to see, is there an evolutionary response? 
And um, I think the next three graphs were probably the most depressing of my dissertation. And that's that when we grow populations collected from invaded areas and populations collected from uninvaded areas in common environments, they don't differ in any of the traits that I measured. They don't differ, differ in tolerance to herbivory, they don't differ in resistance to hypera, and they don't differ in competitive ability. Um, and this is despite the fact that there's genetic variation for all of these traits, and despite the fact that I have just shown you that Metacago increases selection on, on tolerance to herbivory. So lots of strong selection, at least in 2003, but no evidence for a long-term evolutionary response. And it got worse. Um, I also did a reciprocal transplant experiment to test whether or not Lotus had adapted to this invasion. So I took um, lotus populations from invaded sources, lotus populations from uninvaded habitats, planted them into other invaded and uninvaded habitats, and this is what I find. If anything, I find a pattern of local maladaptation. Genotypes collected from invaded areas tend to do worse than genotypes collected from uninvaded areas when planted back into invaded sites. I see this pattern when my gardens were in naturally uninvaded and invaded areas, and also in my experimental Metacaga removal and present plots in, in the experiment that I described earlier. So local maladaptation. This is what we see in the presence of insect herbivores. When we protect these plants from insect herbivores, we do see, seem to see a pattern of local adaptation. Metacog, or sorry, lotus from invaded sites is doing better than lotus from uninvaded sites when we plant them back into invaded environments but only when we protect them from insect herbivores. So this was the graph that completely flummoxed me for, for however many decades now. And um, I think when I was you know, really thinking hard about this data, the conclusion I came to was that, well, you know, Metacago invaded 150 years ago. Maybe Lotus had adapted to that Metacago invasion. Hypera arrived 70 or 80 years later and completely screwed up the local adaptation to Metacago. And I don't think I buy that explanation. Lotus has been growing in the presence of Hypera and Metacago for over 80 years. It's an annual plant, multiple generations. Um, so I'm, I'm skeptical about my, my previous explanation. And instead, what I'm starting to wonder is if, um, if, yeah, if I made the community too simple. So for my dissertation work, I was really focused on these, these three species. And not just because, you know, I was lazy, um, but because this is what I saw when I went out in the field. I saw these, these dramatic effects in the field, and I was convinced that this was a story about this guy and this guy, about Metacago and Hypera. Because who sees herbivory like this? As an stu early graduate student wanting to study herbivory, this was my dream species, right? You never see herbivores attacking a plant like this one. Um, but I think what I forgot about was that these interactions were occurring in the context of this broader community. And there were these other herbivores that might not have been as obvious, that might not have been having as, um, as large visual effects as the Hypera, but they were still possibly important to the evolution of the species. <laughs> and this isn't, a, this isn't a new idea, the idea that, I'll just go back here for a second, that community complexity could potentially limit adaptation. Sharon Strauss recently made this argument um, in the context of invaders coming into new environments, escaping their enemies, escaping all sorts of abiotic agents, and living in these simpler communities, and maybe that makes them better able to adapt to novel environments. Similarly, the whole field of diffuse evolution, diffuse selection, has kind of flirted with this idea for a long time, that community context really matters, that community context could potentially constrain adaptation in some situations. And I think there's a, a few mechanisms that could be important in my study system and, and possibly more generally. And I want to emphasize that they're not mutually exclusive. They don't necessarily just apply to selection in a community context, but they might be especially important there. The first is that diffuse selection may limit adaptation to any one selective agent. And this is the, the idea of genetic trade-offs. Um, and Weiss and Rauscher have this really nice paper that came out a year ago looking at genetic covariances between resistance to various pairs of herbivores. And on one hand, positive covariances could lead to increased adaptation, faster evolution. Negative covariances could possibly constrain evolution or will constrain evolution. 
And I don't think there's any a priori reason to expect that most of these um, covariances will be negative, but in their case, they certainly were. And for most of their, of their pairwise comparisons, they saw evidence for constraint rather than facilitation. And I think it's still too early to know whether this is a general phenomenon or not. The second thing that could be really important in these community contexts is temporal variability in the abundance of biotic selective agents. This could be important in simple environments too, right? But in a complex community, you just have more players that are potentially fluctuating. And amazingly, we don't know a whole lot about temporal variation and selection. So this is a review by Adam Sapielski. It came out a few years ago. He has um, a more recent paper on the subject too. Um, but I had to put, to put this, photo, this graph up here because the bird people are really showing up the plant people. So they have 30-year studies, multiple studies that have measured selection on the same population for more than one or two decades. And here are the plant people down here. And it's amazing to me that there have been that few studies measuring selection on the same population for multiple years. The third thing that I think could um, lead to challenges in ad ad uh, adaptation in complex communities are nonlinear trait damage relationships. And I think these are really important in my system. Uh, this is data from showing the relationship between lotus flowering time and bud galling rates. And it's a pretty strong nonlinear relationship. I saw this pattern in multiple years, and it looks to be maybe a predator satiation type phenomenon. But what this means is that depending on flowering time, you know, you will, you will have either a high proportion of your buds god or a very low proportion. Um, and just a small shift either way will shift you to a, a higher level of damage. Okay, so do I have any evidence in support of this idea that complexity might limit adaptation? Um, the most risky part of my dissertation was this idea that I had that I wanted to do an experimental evolution study. I wanted to let my populations evolve in these replicated treatments for multiple generations, collect the seed, and find out if there had been an evolutionary response. Um, so I did that after two generations of these natural populations growing in my experimental manipulations. And I looked at herbivore growth rate as my measure of resistance in these plants. So you can think about higher values being less defended plants, lower values being more defended plants. And here's what I might expect based on the ecology system of the system and also uh, previous studies of, of natural selection. I might expect that the populations that had been evolving in the presence of metacago and insect herbivores would be the most defended, would have the lowest herbivore growth rates when using these little bioassays. And I might expect that populations or plots that had been protected from insect herbivores with insecticide would be less defended, and the metacaga removal plots might be intermediate. And what I find is that my observations are consistent with predictions in one population, but not in another population. And I think this might be a case where the devil's in the details. This population tends to be dominated by Hypera. This is by far the dominant herbivore in this particular site. Other insect herbivores did not respond to metacago. In this other site, it tends to be much more complex. These other herbivores are more abundant and also more responsive to metacago. So it's two sites, it's hard to make an argument about that, but I think I have an idea for an approach that might help me test this more rigorously and possibly in other study systems too. Um, and that would be to use path analyses to try and figure out how metacago, hypera, mediate interactions with these other herbivores and affect selection on plant traits. And I haven't, I didn't have time to, in my stress-induced rage last week, to formally do this. Um, but if I had to guess that the path diagram for 2002 would look something like this. And if you actually go through and follow the path arrows, this would imply that Metacago and Hypera are weak agents of natural selection, in this case on flowering time. That's the main trait that I'd have, that I'd have the data to look at. Whereas maybe Metacago and Hypera are stronger agents of selection in, in 2003. But one of the things that I'd really like to try would be building these path diagrams and then randomly removing species and seeing how that affects patterns of selection on a focal trait to get at this idea is, is it complexity, is it multi-species that limit adaptation? So just to conclude, strong fitness effects, strong effects on nat patterns of natural selection, but we might not always see an evolutionary response, particularly in these more complex communities. And I'd just like to thank uh, my PhD advisor, Sharon Strauss. She's still giving me good advice um, now through her publications more than day-to-day -day contact, um, and also several people who helped in the field. <laughs>